thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here. Uh, actually, it all started last year in Bordeaux when we were, when we were with Jens, and we were talking a bit uh, on water activity and uh, what were the measure the measurements that we were doing. I will try to do uh, something I would say probably more practical. Uh, I will have some theory, of course, but I would like to you to see uh, from one side uh, the uh, the experience that we had and also how we see also for uh, roasters how it can be used. I don't want to get into molecules and science, etc. I uh, passed a very bad time in food chemistry a long time ago, so for me it's enough. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay. Okay. So to start, uh, we need to know what are uh, the water measurements that we do in general. So basically, first, uh, we have the total moisture. Total moisture, it's, uh, it measures the, master, the, sorry, the mass of water. So that means the percentage of water that is in one body, uh, no matter which. And that is uh, in percentage, so from 0 to 100. Then we have uh, the water activity. What is the difference uh, with the water activity? Actually, the water activity measures uh, the energy of the water to react. That means more than the quantity of water that you have, how free or bounded the water is to actually react in the body. And by meaning react, uh, we mean uh, not so good things, because it could be uh, a mold or a microbiological contamination. So that's basically what measures water activity. I asked a watermelon because I didn't have a breakfast this morning. So it's a <laughs> no, so basically, uh, in the university, uh, when I saw water activity, how they explain me bone water or free water, I think the watermelon is the easiest way to understand. Uh, if I cut a watermelon, you will see a lot of water go out. That will be, uh, yeah, one thing I didn't say, water activity, it's uh, measured from zero to one. So basically, if I cut a watermelon, uh, there will be a lot of water coming in. That uh, water is approach to one. If I then cut uh, the watermelon again, there will still be some water. That water is more bounded to the body. Then if I start chewing the watermelon, there will be some water going into, into, into myself, because I'm eating it, of course. Uh, and that is bounded water. So basically, in a moment, I will continue chewing, chewing, chewing. And there is in a moment that I will have to swallow and actually, uh, just by chewing, I cannot uh, make uh, what we call hydrolysis of, of water. Uh, so it, it will be then my organism who will actually uh, finish this. So how, how can we understand it? Uh, so basically, uh, the watermelon I was telling, so basically it will have a moisture of uh, around 90% and a water activity of 0.99. 0.1 at local temperature because at atmosphere temp um, ambiance temperature sorry because normally uh, water activity is temperature dependent that means that we can say O50 it doesn't mean a big thing you always have to relate it to a temperature uh, so why uh, wasn't this spreadly used in coffee it actually was but only when it was uh, some troubles. And I will come out with uh, one question to all the roasters. Uh, have you ever heard of the Monsoon Malabar? Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. We have uh, 10 kilos freshly roasted of Monsoon Malabar to the person who can reply this, <laughs> can answer this. Who would say what is the uh, moisture and the water activity of a Monsoon Malabar? Who have any idea? 40% moisture. 40% Okay, someone else? I guess 14% and 1.1. <laughs> it's not far. Uh, moisture is good. Normally, uh, Monsoon Malabars, uh, I think they are exported uh, starting from 13% moisture, and they can go up to 16. And water activity, you can normally have 075. So it's actually quite high at 25 degrees. So that's where, when we were using water activity, because there may be a trouble. If you get a, mon uh, a monsoon malabar 
with uh, a moisture of 9%, it will break after the roast, and it may be an old coffee. So basically, uh, that was for the troubles, only when we use it. Uh, basically, when you have 070 uh, at 25 degrees, let's say, you can expect mold in your coffee. When you have a measurement of 080, uh, you may have already microbiological contamination. And when it could happen is when coffee is stored for too much time in origin. Uh, like in, coffee, in countries like DR Congo, we buy coffee from DR Congo. We export it all in August uh, because we know that the conditions are bad and because we know also that uh, they will tell you it will take uh, three weeks uh, to go to, to Mombasa or to Dar es Salaam, depending on where are you taking it from. But the truth is that it can <laughs> pass uh, one month in the customs. So it, it's very complicated. So that's when it came. Now, why we normally don't use it in coffee, and this, I will tell you, uh, the teacher I had in, in food chemistry, is, is she was very good, but, uh, at, at, I mean, she was really, really good, but uh, I think it was not very used in the industry, and her answer, when I asked her, because uh, still at the time that was a university, El Salvador was a big coffee exporter, it's not longer the case, uh, and I say, why don't we measure water activity in coffee? And she said, because the levels of moisture and water activity are too low. She said, you, can, you won't have a trouble with those levels. So that's why I think, it's my theory, that it was not spreadly used. So now I will tell you about the first experience that we had. So we basically, uh, we bought our water activity meter four years ago, and we started uh, measuring. Uh, I had a, we work uh, with one farmer that is called uh, Emilio Lopez. I don't know if you have heard of him. He has a farm called El Manzano. Uh, I put the master of cherries because uh, I have never, I have been in meals all over the world, and I have never seen a meal that works the way he does. He is extremely professional. He is, uh, for the small story, he's now the chairman of the Roasters Guild worldwide, and he's a farmer. So uh, I did some tests with him, and uh, here you have, I have to say something, and basically what you have here as measurements, this is of the last three years. What would you, what would you see here? The first thing that we saw is that naturals are lower than honeys, and honeys than fully washed. That makes logic, isn't it? Then it made logic for this farmer because he's very precise on what he does. Then we have had uh, completely different measurements in other countries between naturals, uh, between washed, and you will see. But basically, with him, we had a delta, so a difference. This is the average delta that we have depending on three years. So you can see that he was actually very, very accurate. Uh, we measure uh, everything at around 23 to 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, normally a water activity meter, it has a chamber. When you put the coffee, it will give you a temperature because it's temperature dependent. So it will always give you a temperature. So this is, uh, this is ideal, <laughs> let's say, in a farm that processes very well. Uh, then, we had troubles. Everybody has troubles. So how do we read the problems back? Uh, we had some troubles in Guatemala. As a Salvadorian, uh, I have to say something, and, and I always say it. I say Guatemala is the Ethiopia of Central America. Basically, you can have some cups that are absolutely outstanding, but it couldn't be that easy. <laughs> so they have some weather conditions that are very complicated. If you are in regions like Atitlan, you are at 1,500 meters. If you are in regions like Huehuetenango, you can have some farms at around 2,000 meters. So that, it will be a very complicated way of drying. So what were the troubles that we had? Is that we had some coffees uh, with water activity at around 065. Uh, and it's actually, we were gonna have a copy of the different coffees I'm talking now. We had some naturals uh, because it was very complicated at uh, around 065, which is very high. And uh, we also had uh, some wash at a very, very uh, low water activity. For a fully wash that was being exported, we were having sometimes uh, levels of under 050, which for us is a refusal. And it's very complicated to explain that actually to a farmer, because he said, but it's coping well? And he said, yes, 
uh, but it may just last one month in my warehouse. So it's something very complicated to, to explain. Then we try always to have an approach of uh, not being like the devil's advocate, but trying better to say, okay, what did you do that went wrong? And what could you possibly do that went well? We have a, an engineer uh, that is working with us in Belco, and she also she actually travels uh, to different to visit different partners uh, because that's a way we think that we can uh, sometimes help more our partners. Uh, she can spend up to two three weeks with them. Uh, actually, she's in she's in Ethiopia now. She's for three months there, uh, and uh, we had uh, she. She did uh, basically something very simple. Actually, we saw that everything was coming from the drying. The drying is something very, um, very uh, important in coffee, and probably uh, we don't measure it uh, that well, but I think that in the future we'll talk a lot of drying and of storage. So basically, you see, she did like a small control that they had to have on every, on the farm, sorry, because it's in Spanish. Uh, and that way, uh, we, we try to control a bit better uh, the drying they were doing. And uh, basically, we had a natural uh, that uh, we're gonna cut this uh, today. It's from uh, Huehuetenango, it's called Finca La Bolsa. And uh, basically, it's still high because it's 059, but it's stable. Because that's one of the things that is very important in water activity. You can measure, but it's always good when you have doubts on, your, on, on how you see the coffee to measure in time. We have had a, we had a, a we have a number, then uh, we know that if, if it has changed that in a month, we should cop, because we may have a trouble. And this one, I think, is the most, uh, is the biggest. We had a, a difference of uh, 0.14, which is really huge. And actually, we found out that they were drying too fast. Uh, it was too, uh, too hot, and sometimes they were drying in six, seven days, which was uh, too high. Uh, then I would like to talk about Nicaragua. I think as an industry, uh, Nicaragua helped a lot to understand water <coughs> activity. And uh, back then, I think it was Nestlé and Espresso who were doing some tests. Uh, I put this phrase, I said, I love horses, but not in my cup. Uh, basically, when you go to Nicaragua, you will see this, uh, that is plastic. So people, they will dry in plastic. Why do they do that? Uh, it's very easy because they don't have uh, the capacity to build more patios, and probably uh, neither uh, to do uh, African beds in sometimes. So basically, they can put plastic uh, all over, even in in the like in the soil. And uh, at night, they will uh, close the plastic. It has been very hot, and at night the temperature comes down. So that will make uh, a condensation. The coffee will sweat. And at that time we had an hydrolysis, which basically we will make more, uh, in coffee you have sucrose, and you will have more, uh, you will have glucose and fructose, which that uh, gives this all crop taste that we can have, and that happens very fast. So basically they were doing this, and, uh, and uh, the water activity levels, they go very high. So basically we were, home, we were having coffees at 065, 070, which for us is a refusal. So what were the results? Uh, if you see, we're gonna have uh, one coffee uh, from one farm that is called Buenos Aires. If you see, all of our uh, coffees, uh, all of the coffees we buy from this meal, they are uh, dry in patios or in African beds. Uh, uh, we pay more, but we ask them not to put the plastics, and we have had some uh, very big difference. Uh, so you see from an estate, what we call state is coffees are scoring 85 more or less, uh, we will have, um, we had a difference of minus 07, which is quite high. And then uh, for our C+, plus, which is an 83 uh, coffee, though it's a regional for us, uh, we had minus 13. So you can see it was a huge, huge difference, and that is, uh, is very stable, basically. So this is what we uh, had as experience in Nicaragua, and I think it was the first time uh, that I had a trouble with water activity, actually, for this origin. Uh, then uh, we had also uh, some troubles uh, when doing soaking. Soaking is, uh, 
is something that is very uh, used in uh, in Africa, in Eastern Africa, and that is now done uh, quite a lot in Central America. For example, this farmer we work in Nicaragua, he's doing soaking, and he was proposing a soaking. We buy like 10 bags. Uh, we did a micro lot uh, that we're gonna cop. You're gonna have the same uh, varietal that is called Maracaturra, uh, which is an hybrid of uh, Maragogip and Caturra, that uh, processing fully washed and in the soak way. So you can see the difference. So why do we do the soaking? There are some phenolic compounds uh, that have that are responsible of the harsh flower, so the flavor, sorry. So it's basically everything that could be dirty or something. Uh, and normally by soaking, we take this out. So we normally should have a cleaner cup. Uh, that's why we, uh, that's, that's why it's used normally. But at the same time, these composants are sometimes also uh, those that give the stability to coffee in time. So basically we take them out as well. So what we have seen is that these coffees, depending on the uh, number of hours that people soak, they may, le they may last less. So actually there, is, there should be a limit as well. Um, and also, as uh, if you remember what I say from El Salvador, when we put the coffee in water, it will take water. So if we do soaking, uh, it will take more water. It will absorb more water. Even uh, if uh, in one farm, in, in Guatemala, one time a farmer told me that he saw some parchment germinated, just for you to have the idea. Uh, so basically, it gets very uh, high level of water activity, and at the same time, this is uh, molecules of water that will be unbounded, so that will be free. So basically, if a farmer does a good soaking, respecting a time of uh, a limited time, he will have to be very careful on the drying because he will have to uh, do a different drying than what he's normally used to do. And uh, we're gonna have uh, two coffees, so as I say, maracaturras, uh, one that is a fully wash and the other that is a soak. Again, to come to what I said in the first, I give some numbers, uh, but still, Look, a fully wash, it's around 064, and a, so and a socket is 069. At Belco, we accept coffees uh, from 060, from 050, sorry, to 065 at 23, 25 degrees. So we accept them. But you can see that there is a big difference between one and the other. Uh, and the last thing that I promised some samples, and you, you caught them already, but unfortunately, I wouldn't have them for this. Uh, for this uh, presentation, uh, for, for this copy that we're gonna have, it was from Indonesia. Uh, the first time I went to Indonesia, everybody was telling me coffee is bad there, process is bad, and above all, everybody was talking very bad about Welco. So I came out to, to Indonesia and I asked them, and for this I would look this, this is West Flores, uh, this is uh, one community that is called the Guairebus. How would you dry coffee there? It is very complicated. And that's how they explain me what is the wet hoop and, why, and what do they use wet hoop for. So basically, uh, the wet hoop, it is, uh, in Indonesia, for you to have an idea, they have five different ways of processing the cherry. They will have what they call semi-washed, which is not the semi-wash like we do in Colombia or in Central America. Actually, their semi-wash is that they will depot the coffee, and after that, they will uh, make a dry fermentation. So they will put it in tanks without water. Then they will have what they call fully washed. The fully washed will be the pulp, and then it will be fermented in water. So they will put water in the tanks. Then you will have honeys, like normal honeys, because now they're doing. Then you will have what they call natural, uh, which is like the one we caught the other day. The natural is basically selective cherry uh, picking and then dry in a natural way. And then they will have the pea. Uh, DP means uh, natural, but all common, all, com all, way, all, all kind of cherries. So basically it's a very uh, low quality coffee. So that is about the, the, the cherry processing, but then you will have the hooling. So they have wet hooling and dry hooling. And what is the difference or why do they do it? 
What they know as dry hooling is what is done all over the world. What is known as wet hoo, and they explain me, it can be any of these four processes, but they hool it at a level of 30 to 40% moisture. So basically, if they do that, the, the, coffee, the coffee will be exposed to, uh, to everything. Because it's, imagine a 30, 40% uh, being dry that way, uh, it, it will get contaminated. In a, in a moment, it will get, and it will be completely unstable. When we did the first test, the water activity that we were having was from 065 to 075. So it's, it's really high. And basically, those are coffees that will get brown very fast, I would say two months, maybe, in a warehouse in Europe. So what, what did we do? We did a, we did a big, uh, uh, no, probably not a big, but at least we, we start trying to control the wet hole. So actually, uh, they started uh, doing some hooling at lower uh, moisture uh, content than they were doing. Because 30, 30, 40 for me was too much. I told them, I don't think we're gonna be able to get anything stable. So they started coming down and down and down. And we actually did, uh, actually we were coping. And that way we can have this uh, wet hole taste. And at the same time, have a coffee that is stable. So we actually, we established with them a level of moisture at which they do the hauling. And then uh, the way they dry, basically it's like this. This is a cooperative that is called Classic Beans. I always say that it's like their, their brand, these uh, greenhouses. Because uh, this is, uh, they have, uh, sometimes they can have even up to two, three levels of, uh, of uh, beds to dry. And then they will close it out with plastic for, the, for how the, the atmosphere is. And this can be open, actually. So it can circulate. So this is a bit uh, the difference experience that we have had in, 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 in the last years. And something uh, very interesting is that we have all our wet holes for the last two years. Uh, they have been under 060, and they're not far. It's the same process, it's semi-wash dry, uh, semi dry hole and semi-wash wet hole. They will have around the same. So we see that it actually can work. And what about the roasters? Uh, I focus mainly on the experience uh, we had, but uh, what would you do when you get different water activities? So there can be, and we have seen, four uh, different cases. So the first is high moisture and high water activity. Why do we consider high moisture? We would say it's uh, uh, probably uh, over uh, 11.5, that we will consider is a high moisture. And then uh, water activity will consider to start being high at uh, 0.63, at 23, 25 degrees. Um, why this can happen? This could probably be a problem of drying. So basically the farmer probably he, he dried the coffee too fast. Uh, you may start at a high temperature, but it will, it will rust very quickly because actually you have a lot of free water, so it may normally evaporate. So it will be very complicated for you to uh, to control the end of the the end of the roast. Uh, the second case uh, that we have is high moisture and low water activity. This it should be the ideal because it's the most stable coffee that uh, that you can have. So you may need an extra heat for the low moisture because you have less conductivity, uh, but in early stage, just there, and then actually you will be able to control your roast. Uh, there is a third case that will be low moisture and high water activity. Why this may be? Uh, it could be it could be for uh, for uh, for different reasons. Uh, it will be probably taking uh, taking it from the atmosphere. So that will be how are you warehousing? This could this could make it that you see first uh, uh, an increase in water activity than in than in moisture. Uh, same thing, it may evaporate quickly during the drying phase, so you shouldn't slow down the burner because after that it will react as a dry coffee. And then the fourth, the fourth case, it will be a low moisture and low water activity. Why it could happen? A coffee may be getting old, a coffee has already a couple of months, 
So what you should do, you should really put a lot of heat on it. <laughs> so these are the four cases uh, that I think that are interesting for roasters. This is, uh, we are not roasters, uh, so I would say this is only the uh, kind of experience that we have for what we see. But I think that is uh, a lot of things uh, that roasters should start uh, paying attention to. Uh, how are they gonna, uh, how, how do they store their coffee? How your coffee reacts after one week, uh, after one month, after two months? Uh, I think it's, it's very important uh, because same as I said, in origin countries, it's gonna be really important. Uh, we're gonna be talking a lot about drying and about storage. So I think for roasters, storage is also something very uh, important. So this is a bit, and thank you. No, actually they, they will do the wet hole because the parchment at, uh, at the temperatures that they have, it will get mold. Okay. Thank you. So that's basically, they prefer to dry it in green because in green you won't get the mold. But it was something that they were not measuring actually. So lots of interesting stuff here. Questions will be pouring out of the room, I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So you're not getting first this oh, okay. time. Okay. <laughs> Hard night, uh, Thank you, Carlos. Did you have any testing of, for example, storage at warehouse in terms of leaving it in Grain Pro or taking it out of Grain Pro and storing it some other way? Honestly speaking, we haven't yet done the test, uh, but uh, it is normal that we will say that Grain Pro it is normally a way of very of better uh, preserving coffee. Then it, it, it could it could be very tricky. You know, the first time that we put grain pro in uh, coffees from Gear Congo, it was a mess. <laughs> so, but that's completely different. So, so yeah, I, I, I would say it's uh, I would say we have an incident for sure. Is it my turn now? Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Yeah. No, sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's, I mean, uh, we all know how interesting uh, both water activity and moisture is to all of us, both as roasters and importers. Uh, but I wanted to ask, because um, I remember when we were in Poland, you were also there, uh, someone were talking about uh, that a kind of... You were in Poland? Oh, <laughs> maybe I just missed you so much. <laughs> um, we were talking about uh, coffee actually having like a Bayard process also in the warehouse that it turns brown. Do you know why? Because you also said that it will go brown due to like high moisture or whatever. I know, I was talking about the wet hole. Okay, we're talking about wet Yeah, because the wet hole actually, it is very blue. Yeah. Uh, and when it gets old, it gets uh, like brown. Okay. Brown color. Like More a banana. Banana. Brown. Yeah, yeah, banana. What, what you can have when you have high levels of water activity is what we, can, we know as a sponge. Mm. So, so basically, the, the, the bean will get uh, a bit bigger. Mm. So while I'm bringing the mic here, I have a question myself quickly while I'm walking. Is it? Uh, this is the hook. It's not me who wrote it. No. Okay. <laughs> so how does uh, the the water activity meter work? Actually, do you know how it measures it? There are different, uh, there are different uh, water activity measures that you have. Actually, it goes inside the bin, and it will analyze it. Basically, it doesn't burn it. The technology of the one we have, I couldn't tell you. Uh, what I know is that it's temperature dependent. And then I could talk about some brands, because I know that there are some uh, that you can do uh, a way of uh, heating. Ours don't. So it's more, uh, no, to be honest, I don't know. Mm. No, I... Angel, yes, Angel, you talked about uh, a couple of days ago, and you also mentioned it this morning, the difference between monosaccharide and disaccharide glucose. glucose? And, yeah, how that changes the, the water activity. Was that... Ah, no. What I was saying is that basically, when uh, what we know as all crop taste, it can be the hydrolysis, hydrolysis of sugar. And there are some studies actually in coffee that have been done that when you have higher levels of fructose, you get the old crop taste. So that's what I was saying. And in Nicaragua, basically, you get hydrolysis uh, of, you get the hydrolysis quicker. But how would you get a higher 
amount of fructose that will come naturally. Ah, because of eating the beans in the warehouse. No, no, because you get the actually you got the, the sucrose, which is a disaccharide. So when when you separate, it, you will have a higher level of, of fructose because of dissociating them. Patrick? <laughs> so, two questions. First, um, is there any data on preference water activity levels in different varieties grown in different countries, meaning that uh, the perfect value could differ depending on variety and country or, or to some extent process which you already referenced but mm -hmm. if you take four different naturals from four different countries four different regions could all of them benefit from different values or would you argue that it's a set value second question um, water activity which is something I think about a lot uh, and from our roasting perspective we haven't gathered enough data on this but we're at a point where we're not just thinking water activity, we're thinking water activity in relationship to the size of the bean, which should in theory from a roasting perspective makes a big difference as well. So I'm wondering if that is something that you guys are looking into also. Okay, uh, so basically for, for your first question, uh, I would say we have established parameters of acceptance. Uh, then, uh, you see when I put the, the farm in Manzano, uh, that we're gonna cope. Actually, you're gonna see it's called la cumbre because la cumbre means the peaks, the peak, but it's el manzano. Uh, that is something ideal because we know that he can do that uh, in long term. But then we have, uh, for what we have seen, we work with around 30 origins. Uh, so we have an acceptance from 050 to 065. So I, I wouldn't say that there is idea. I would think that probably naturals, there should be closer to 050 than 2065. Like for example, the natural uh, that I presented from Guatemala that we're gonna cop, uh, it is 059, so it's quite high. So I know it's not yet ideal. Then we have seen that it gets stable. Then I will say that from, uh, that it will be depending on processing. Then depending on roaster, I would say that it's easier to control for a roaster when you have lower, uh, closer to 050, yeah. because basically it's more stable. Yeah. So you can actually, let's say what roaster normally thinks when they think of moisture and how I'm gonna roast, depending on the moisture that I have, uh, it, is a bit, uh, it is a bit tricky for water activity. So if you have it lower, you are closer to what you think. And if it's higher, you have to adapt. That's, that's, that's what I would think on this. Then in, one, in what concerns uh, your other question, the density of the bean, I think, is very important. Uh, as you may see, uh, what what normally is done in coffee is that you ask for a screen to to a farmer. So you say, I want it to be 15 and up. I want it to be 16 and up, etc. What we do is that we have a dispersion because we think that way can make a, a full idea to the roaster on how he's going to roast. Because, for example, if you have high dispersion, uh, it will be uh, very complicated for the roaster. Uh, to roast it and actually everything that you normally think Ima imagine that you have a high dispersion in the coffee that you have uh, something in Guji you can have screen from 13 to 19 uh, pro probably not 19 but mostly uh, and you have uh, imagine high high uh, high levels so you would say okay I can heat it up but the truth is that it's for a dispersion that you have you have to apply a more gentle uh, roasting because otherwise you will have some beans that are gonna be burned without being developed. While the more dense, they will be developed. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I think that will be more or less the, the correlation. I don't see a direct correlation between the bean. Probably the surface of contact, of course, is important. One thing that you need to think of water activity, think uh, uh, like a, a sponge. When you, when you squeeze a sponge, there's some water. But the water that is still in the in the sponge is like the water activity. But uh, like certain of some relation, I, I couldn't tell. I don't know if that answers your question. Kind of. Okay, uh, Simo. I am good. Um, much easier question this one. Uh, uh, you you you've been asking uh, talking about um, some different um, 
recommendations about uh, water activity and the moisture content, uh, which is very nice. Um, but roasting in Nordic countries where the temperatures can vary a lot mm. from about minus 20 <coughs> to whatever. So my question is actually related to the storage of the coffee. Then how does the temperature, the, yeah, the storage temperature affects the water activity? If there is any correlation there. I think it will be, uh, like if you have, uh, le let's imagine that you have for more of a period of 24 hours, uh, very low temperatures, the winter, let's say, water, uh, actually your coffee may absorb. So basically you may have probably uh, high uh, water activity levels. Uh, that that would be uh, something. Then if it's dry, actually it will go down and you will have this correlation. What I think uh, that is important or, or interesting for roasters, uh, the first thing, and what is ideal, you know, what everybody will tell you is like have a control warehouse. So we know that, it, that not anybody can have. So in Belco, we said, try to control your warehouse. So basically, if you have a hygrometer, a thermometer, you can probably put it in different parts of your warehouse, see how it is, and say like, okay, here, it's, uh, I can get more cold, or it's more, uh, let's say, related to the, to the ambient. So basically, you could say, okay, here, I'm gonna store the coffee, that it goes faster, for example. That could be an idea. I think it's like try to control the warehouse. And then if you measure water activity, I would say that you need to probably check once per month the, 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 how your coffee is reacting to that. And based on that, think on how I'm gonna do like, okay, I'm having, we have some numbers that we know that can, can work. Uh, for example, if you have from 0.02 change in one month, I would say you should cup your coffee and see what is going on. Uh, so I think that's something that probably you could do. Thank you. Are there any specific temperatures where you minimize the delta uh, over time? If you control it. So it's just stability is what, mm, yeah. Stability, yeah. Actually, that's what you look in coffee in general, stability. Just really quickly about uh, the dry milling process, because I mean that in my mind would affect uh, water activity. Do you have any experiences as far as type of dry milling will affect, like type of machines, the heat that they generate while dry milling coffee will it affect the water activity? Uh, it, it, yeah, it could. If you uh, there, there are some. Uh, if you put too much pressure in in the dry milling, it will of course make uh, your your moisture come down. And normally the moisture is also correlated to water activity. That's something I could think. And it's gonna be very related to what it is in the storage because you apply a very strong pressure that I would think in dry milling in any cases. I would see more on the way of extra drying probably if you apply too much pressure. To Grim. So you say that uh, if you have a high water activity in a coffee, you cannot store it longer when reducing the temperature in the storage. Because in, in Norway, like, practically many stories is like uh, from zero to 10 degrees during winter. Mm. Will that uh, expand the, the shelf life of the coffee if you have a lower temperature? Reducing the, 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 the problem of the fading of the coffee, I mean. Yes, you know that there are some things. Uh, so basically, you're saying if you have very low temperatures, very if you have water con uh, water activity uh, measurements of uh, 65, uh -huh. and then you 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 are pretty worried about that coffee. Um, yeah. If you put it into storage, mm. should you burn it like hell now, get it into market, or yeah. should, should you? expect that if we reduce the, the temperature mm -hmm. in the warehouse, then it could uh, okay. have a longer la the lifetime. Yeah, basically what you need, uh, what, what, the problem there is that you're already reading a problem. So probably, uh, probably I would say, yeah, uh, go fast, uh, take it out because you may have a trouble. So basically what I would say is that uh, 
uh, when you have your pre-shipment sample, uh, test it well. So basically that way you can avoid, because the problem is that if it's in your warehouse, it's in your, it's in your warehouse already. So basically, yeah, I would, say, I would say pass it fast. If you have like, let's imagine three coffees, uh, then pass that in the first time. Or, or find a solution for that, but yeah, it's uh, that, that's what I, that's what I will think. But in general, for what we have seen is uh, is that you may have a trouble. Then you need also, and as I was saying, keep controlling, because imagine that I'm saying, okay, it's all 65. All 65 for us is still an approval, but if you get a reduction or increasing during a month, that means that you will have a trouble. And that way you need to copy it back again and say, okay, now what I can do. So it, it could be probably that it's stable. It's, it's, it's again, you need to test it. Wait, I think I have like one question. Yeah. Um, you can do that okay. first, it's fine. Um, thanks to the talk, really enjoyed it. I was wondering um, if you're at origin and you don't have like the technology so, or the means to, or access to buy a, like a moisture activity meter. Is there anything like without using technology that you can, by observation or testing, can work out the moisture activity on coffee? As in everything, I w it is very expensive. Uh, normally, I don't know if I can say a brand, but there is one uh, brand that is called Aqualab. Uh, for you to have an idea, uh, they, I never know how to pronounce this, Pac, Pau Quick, Pau Quick, I think. Poke it. Poke it. <laughs> the poke it uh, is very good. Normally, they will tell you for origin. Uh, we have one in our, in our office in Addis Abeba, for example, but it costs 2,000 euros. So it's, it's uh, still expensive. And then Aqualab, they will have the 40E, that is the one that we have in our lab, that is way more precise, that is very good, and it goes up to 8,000 euros. So it's extremely expensive. So what I would say is like everything in coffee is relational. You, know, like you, you, you need to be uh, very close to your partners and actually try to advise them on how they are. You see, for example, I was saying Emilio uh, in El Salvador, he's probably the most professional farmer I ever met. He doesn't measure where I think. But every time I get a pre-shipment sample, I send him a full report on his coffee, and I send him a full report also on the arrivals. So I would say that would be the way, at, at least at this moment. Then I know that there are exporters that are starting to, to, to invest in that. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's expensive technology, you know, like everything, you know, what, is, uh, what is of a lab. It's me again, sorry. Um, I just wanted to go back to the warehouse thing and regarding both Twiggyam's uh, question. Uh, and also, it's kind of like an open question because as far as I'm concerned, if, I mean, if coffee is rating a certain water activity, that water is indeed free and it will travel to stabilize the area where it's in. Mm -hmm. So like if you're really unlucky and some water has come onto the back or in during the warehousing or during the moving, this will be then uh, captured and then that water will um, spread itself out in order to stabilize the rest. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I'm so confused. <sighs> I don't even know whether it's a question, but it's just like, as far as I know, the water will always try to stabilize itself. So as long as you can control at least the temperature, like you're saying, then yeah. you're doing everything mm. you can, basically. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very tricky. I yeah. mean, you, even for us, like in the warehouse, we have a project, then you probably are gonna have the time to talk to Cesar. Cesar is our quality manager. Yeah. We have a whole uh, project of controlling our warehouse mm. to see how, how is the better, because that, for example, will come back to your question about the grain probe. Mm. If you had the grain probe, and for some reason, imagine that the roaster didn't put the coffee in the pallet to make the water out, so that the grain probe would, would avoid it. So I think it's, uh, yeah, it's quite, uh, it's quite complicated. Back to the question about the cold, it may take also yeah. water from the atmosphere. Timmy, you have a question? Yeah. 